You think your life is like a song But you know you live it wrong You think your life is like a song I wanna ask you where you going Where you going What you doing What you doing Is it Christ Is it Christ That you pursuing that you, you walk pursuing. around with your head in the clouds You need to wake up Ain't saying nothing but always so loud Come on, man. Can't tell you nothing cause dad you so proud Humble yourself Always think someone trying to diss you It's not my fault the gospel's like a heat sink and missile You can hide behind religious but it'll still get you Drunk But it impact so hard and will sure split you You wanna live without Christ man I ain't with you you can go in that direction, I ain't coming to get you You keep saying you want the truth, yo, I'm trying to hit you Like a restaurant wait, I really want to tip you About the truth, yo, the guys, I know they trying to pip you I want to ask you where you going Amen, amen, I was already shared this with Brother Ron And um, I shared this with Brother Ron and uh, Brother Mike But um, I was watching um on one of the history channels about Hannibal um, And um, his, his conquest and his and the way he fought, and they said he was just a military genius. You know, the Romans were very good at strategies and fighting and how they did it, but Hannibal outsmarted these guys, right? He actually, he outsmarted them a few times, and, you know, he, he defeated them in a lot of big battles, right? And I'm looking at this, and I'm blown away by it, by, because they didn't have conventional weapons. They had, you know, you know, they had swords and spears, but, you know, and they didn't have, you know, how they communicated with each other was unbelievable. They would blow the horns and have certain signals and the armies would move in different directions. You know, they would move in different directions and, you know, and, and, and strategically to, to maneuver war maneuvers. And, um, he, he out, he, you know, he defeated them the first time, the big battle, 40,000 men. Then the second time they said they assembled one of the biggest armies at that time Rome ever assembled 80,000 men. They said he, 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 he beat them and defeated them in six hours, killed close to 70,000 men. It was a slaughter, right? A mad, they call it the, the, the battle of annihilation, right? And all of that, um, they said something that, that blew me away, right? And this is what, what really got me. They said in all of his conquests, he still was a failure because he didn't win the war. Rome eventually got Hannibal, Scipio. You know, even in one battle, they said he wounded Scipio. And Scipio had to come back later, you know, and finally got him. He was older, but he got him later. Um, Scipio Africanus. We said that's, they begin to call Africa after him because uh, uh, they defeated Hannibal and they was just, you know, he terrorized Rome for said over 20 years. But my point is, is that when they said that he didn't win the war, he still failed. Uh, God spoke to me in my, in my inner man and, and let me know sometimes we suffer great losses in battles. Rome suffered great losses, but they still won the war. You know, we can't get caught up in our day-to-day -day battles. Sometimes we'll lose. Sometimes we'll lose real big, but it doesn't mean that we lost the war, you know? Technically, Christ already won it for us. Let's, let's just be honest. But it's our personal. Satan attacks us in our individual uh, 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 walks, in our individual ministry. That's how he gets us. His main job is to get us to give up, not understanding what Christ did for us, not understanding the grace of God that, that God gave us. The Bible says no matter how much sin we got, God has more grace. But not understanding that and putting the focus more on what we go through in our daily, day-to-day -day lives. And we go through a lot. You know, sometimes we lose. Again, we suffer great loss. I have suffered great loss in my Christianity, but I kept going. You know, they said that when Hannibal defeated them the last time in the 80,000, the 70,000 that got, you know, the Battle of Annihilation, they said Hannibal sent them like, you know, terms for peace and and, and Rome sent them back one word, none. You know, they didn't let those, the, that, those battles that take over and make them feel defeated and make them give up. They kept going till they won eventually. And in Christ, you know, that's what God showed me about us as believers, guys. We got to keep going. You can't let them day to day, you know, the, your, your daily battles and your shortcomings dictate, you know, the outcome of your Christianity as a believer. You know, you got to keep your trust in Christ, your faith in Christ, understand we're saved by grace. God had to teach me that through experience because I used to think I used to put a lot on myself as a believer. I think too much on myself. I think more on myself that God wanted me to put on myself, you know. And as believers, don't get me wrong, God don't want us living lives that just don't bring him no glory, lives that resembles the old life so much so people can't see the new life. That's not what God wants.
But at the same time, within our shortcomings, we have to acknowledge the fact that, hey, let me get up. This is what Christ died for. Let me keep going. Because, I, you know, just because I lost the battle mean I lost the war. Let me keep going. Let me stay in the fight. Let me keep going. Don't give up. Keep preaching the gospel. Don't ever make Satan make you feel so guilty, you know, and so, you know, uh, unworthy because we are that you can't open your mouth to tell people about Jesus because that's the victory right there for us as believers right there. No matter what we go through, we got to press on. We got to continue to declare the gospel. Don't let your shortcomings determine who you are and who you're not in Christ. You got to press on. That's all I want to say. Wow. Amen, brother. Powerful. Amen, brother. Powerful, Amen. powerful, brother. Yeah. Now, that's real talk right there. And uh, I think uh, really on cue when we go through this uh, section of scripture, uh, reflect back on what Bishop is saying here, because I think we'll see that that reality actually uh, made itself relevant, you know, to, to the apostles. Right. What he's saying is so, so accurate um, in that. Um, very good point. Um, so yeah, so um, just to reflect a little bit last week, I think we, we ran through this, but uh, again, Jesus, uh, Matthew 26, uh, we talked about Jesus and the disciples, uh, again, Gavin from Last Supper, uh, powerful uh, in itself, uh, the revelation that one of them were going to betray him. Um, and just to kind of bring clarity to that, yes, uh, all of them, I know some of the scriptures say, it was just Judas, but yet yeah, when when you do the research, pretty much all of them was asking, "Is it I? Is it I? Is it I?" Right? Similar to um, just that that sin consciousness that's within all of us. Um, you know, just you know, like you look down, you know, at your shirt. Is it dirty? Is it stained? But just that psychological thing of the apostles, you know, because I think in deep down in their minds, they all may have been thinking certain things about who the Messiah was. We talked a lot about the influence of the zealot. We know that one of the apostles was a former zealot. So just because someone was something before doesn't mean they don't talk about and make reflection to the past and, and the men that they once were at one time. We do that also here amongst ourselves, right? Uh, and then of course, Jesus establishing the sacrament of, of communion. So that was pretty much what we went through last week. Um, Brother Rick, amen, brother. Good to have you in a place of reading. If you don't mind, please read 31 through 37, Matthew chapter uh, 26, please, if you can. Then says Jesus unto them, all you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called the Semite. And saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Mm -hmm. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Stop right there. A couple of pieces of meat, guys, I want you to chew on. Uh, the first thing uh, I want to bring attention to is in verse 31. Now, I love this part here because, again, this is a reminder of what Jesus is making certain clarity, or ye shall be offended uh, because of me this night. Um, Bishop and I kind of played around with this a little bit because again, if you guys remember last week when we began to shed light on how the, uh, the Jewish community uh, foresees or saw their vision of Christ, we did want to make it crystal clear that not all Jewish uh, views are the same. Right? We have the the uh, uh, Reformed Jewish community, of course, the rabbinic uh, Orthodoxy Jewish community. And so there, and, there, and there are even some more in between that, that go back and forth with, with, the, with the vision of, uh, with their vision of who the Messiah really is. But I think this speaks to the fact of the, uh, of the Orthodoxy Jewish community that's, was, that when you listen to how they compute that Jesus is not the Messiah, it really shows a sense of offense here. I think it's because 
again, their whole vision was that the Messiah was going to be a judgment king, was going to come back, set the record straight, smite all the enemies, and put Israel back at the top of the pecking order. And again, we all know that that's not what took place. And so we can see that the birth of that attitude towards Jesus didn't just happen overnight. It was there and it laid festered and it dor and it laid dormant. And I'm gonna have to say that even with a lot of the pain and suffering uh, that this particular community has gone through over the decades and the centuries, um, again, this is a scripture that I always try to share with the, uh, even the Hebrew Israelites when they come and say, oh, you know, when it's speaking specifically to the Cushite kingdoms of the world, you know, I always try to say the sheep of the flock, this is talking about Jesus's sheep that's going to be scattered abroad. The Christian community, again, uh, scattered abroad. Uh, another piece of meat that I love is verse 32. Notice how Jesus is declaring before time, only a prophet, only a man from God can say something. Jesus says, I, after I am risen again, that's a declaration that only God can, can do, right? Uh, no other man has the power to say what, what, what they're going to do, right? And notice that Jesus in his prophetic form says, when I am risen again, right? So this is something that probably did go over a lot of the disciples' heads because we know that a lot of them had not come to grips with the reality uh, that Jesus must pass away. Um, verse 33, again, um, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Guys, this is speaking to us today in this timeline, right? A lot of the messages that we've taught over the years, a lot of the way we break down sacred scripture on this channel, uh, we get into it, guys. We talk about the things that a lot of groups choose to sugarcoat or dance around. And the gospel is very, very offensive to a fallen world that's trying to hold on to the things that won't last forever. They become very, very, very offended. So this is a reminder of when you're speaking and teaching true Christianity, it's just not going to mix with what the world's uh, servant, right? Almost literally like oil uh, and water. And again, uh, verse 34, the prophetic, 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 prophetic words of, of Jesus declaring the number of completion three times, God's number of completion that Peter before the cock crows, you'll deny me. Um, anybody else want to chime in on that? Brother Mike, what you got? Great, praise the Lord, brother. I, I, I like this text soon. Um... It kind of ties into, um, you know, how Cal opened up with his testimony. I like how the whole time that he said that to Peter, you know, we know that this prophetic that they had this guy that they came back and we know Peter, you know, laid his life down. We know that, you know, Jesus came back and he resurrected, asked him, do you love me three times? We get all that. But what I like about him, he says to, to Peter, you want to you're gonna, you're gonna deny me three times? He's like, I'm going to go with you to the end. And he says, no, you're going to deny me. One thing I like about what I learned is God know who what we can do and what we can't do in Christ. When I first got saved, I thought I could do a whole bunch. I thought I was like a superhuman in Jesus. I do all this, you know, do this for your Lord, do that. And God knew what my what my limitations was, and He knew what I could do with Him. You know, He knew my frailties better than I knew them. You know, I didn't realize how frail I was until I got saved. I didn't realize how weak I was until I got saved. I realized that God truly knew knew me. But the powerful thing is that though he denied, like we come from the streets when when somebody denies you when they're going through the heart of something, that we cut them off forever. Like you act like you didn't know me when I when I, when, it, when it went down, you know. But one thing about God, he's different. He knew that Peter was his man, you know. Like he knew Peter all the way to the end. Peter got crucified upside down. We know he laid his life down, but. You know, the powerful thing is that God knows what we can do in him and what we can't do in him. He knows our limitations, and he also knows how great we are in him as well, right? And we have to understand, like um, the, uh, like uh, Brother Cal opened up with, you know, you got to keep going. You know, we can't get uh, discouraged when we don't meet our expectations in Christ because God has his, God knows our, God's, God knows his expectations, and we have our own expectations. And for a very long time, I try to meet my expectations in Christ and God had his own expectations on me. You know, his expectation was, you know, knowing that he said, knowing that what I would do, what I can't do, what I could do, what I will do. And sometimes I was talking to Bishop earlier today, 
sometimes it's the simple things that God wants us to do. We get so wrapped up in all these big things that we, we want to do. And God, like, I just want you to do this. I just want you to be faithful with the fellowship. I just want you to come out and keep learning about me, you know? And sometimes it's the simple things, you know? And I don't want to go ahead and run, but if you go into Garden of Gethsemane and they start praying and everything like that, it's just the simple things, you know? And sometimes we make things very technical when God is very simple. But I love the way he dealt with Peter. He showed Peter, like, I know how weak you are, you know? I know that you ain't going to go with me to the end. But later on, he still knew Peter was this man, even though he was weak. And um, at times we do get weak and sometimes we do lose those battles, but we still belong to him. And I love that about God, you know? That's all I want to say. Amen. Amen. I like that a lot. I, I would come in too and say this, right? That um, um, Peter was genuine when he said, I'll die for you. This is the beautiful thing right here. When Peter said, I'll die for you, he was 100% genuine, right? He wasn't playing. He, there was no deception in what he was talking about. He meant every word. See, Christ knows us better again. We said this before, then we know ourselves, right? But he knows when you're being real. He knows when you're faking. That's the key thing. He knows your flesh. He said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We underestimate the power of the flesh. That's why I look at it, a lot of these cults, these non-Christian cults and Christian cults, and they put so much expectation on their flesh. It, it makes no sense to me, Right. He said, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And when you're feeling yourself, here's the, here's the catch 22. When you're feeling yourself too much, that self-righteous spirit, God hates that too. See, he hates that a little more than the others. You know, when we fall short and we, we say, Lord, I'm, you know, I, I, I try, but I, I just, I'm just so unworthy. He respects that more than somebody who thinks they got it all together. Right. But my point is, is that Peter really was genuine when he said, Lord, I will die for you. See, God knows when we make them declarations, he knows how far we're really going to go. He knows that we meant it, though, in our hearts. We didn't just say it for lip service or said it just, you know, just to impress someone else or to try to make somebody believe we're with it in our heart. We got so much unbelief. It doesn't, you know, it, 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 it takes over our lives completely. You know, unbelief is what keeps us from being the Christians we want to be. But, but Peter said it with all his heart and he still failed. You know, God, the, my point I just want to say is that God knows when you mean it and when you don't. That's all I want to say. Amen. 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 Powerful. Absolutely accurate. That's what it's all about. And um, that's exactly what we want to take out of these, these passages. Amen. All right. So with that being said, uh, you pretty much said it. Peter's denial. Jesus, again, predicting that Peter would deny him three times. Again, Peter insisting that he would never do it again, as Bishop eloquently put it, the heart was definitely absolutely 100% in the right place. And ultimately we know that the Peter denied him three times. Again, this is the whole point about staying in courage, staying in the fight, staying in the war, staying in the battle and not allowing the small losses. Uh, although this didn't seem small to Peter at the time, uh, didn't even seem small to me either when I first read it, but nevertheless, in the grand scheme of things, a small, minute uh, hiccup on the way to, to the victory. Key takeaway again, I like this. Bishop said it as well. Brother Mike said it as well. Don't let's don't underestimate the power of sin, guys. I mean, let's be realistic. I heard a debate with a guy, you know, he was like, God gave us the power to do all the things that we need to do. We just have to do it. We don't need anybody to do anything. We didn't need anybody to lay down our lives. Uh, this Christianity, I think we kind of alluded to it back when we did the Black History uh, a couple of weeks ago, the power of self. Uh, one of the things that attracted a lot of us as young African-American men on the call was the strength and the power of the, of the Muslim movement with Malcolm X and things like that, that mind over body thing. But again, guys, don't underestimate the power of sin. We are playing with fire. Um, there is no way under no circumstances that under the fallen uh, model, right? What is the fallen model? The fallen model is that in the Garden of Eden, Adam was equipped at that moment in time to deal with this power of sin because God had created man at that time perfect in his image. 
Okay, guys, but let's make no mistake. The fallen man, the men that we are here now in these bodies, these weak vessels that we walk around in day in and day out, cannot compete unless we fully understand the weapons and the power of the fallen man and understand clearly the enemy that we're in the ring with. I, I always love to use boxing. I was watching a documentary the other night. It was showing that um, Ali was supposed to take a tune-up fight because he wanted to take a quick fight to get him in shape because he was trying to get back uh, in the ring to fight uh, 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 Joe Frazier for the championship. And so he said, oh, I'll take this little quick tune-up fight you know, and he goes into a ring with a man by the name, no other than Kenny Norton. And in that tune-up fight, Ali got his body beat up, his jaw broke, and he ends up losing the fight. And so what am I saying, guys? I'm saying that we cannot underestimate the power of sin and underestimate the, the weaknesses that we are in these bodies. We have to stay on point. We have to stay in our word and we have to stay connected. Uh, connected with brothers and sisters that share and understand what we're absolutely dealing with here. So that's the key takeaway we have with that. Brother Rick, if you don't mind, could you please pick up with verses 38 and start reading through down to 43. Matthew chapter 26. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray and that ye, not, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now. And take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Let right us, there. let us. You can, you can okay. stop right there. Um, yeah, guys, don't get caught sleeping, man. You know, don't don't get caught sleeping. Uh, I thought that was a very, very significant uh, moment and, and a wake up call, literally for for a few reasons. One, that what do we take away from that garden scene? The hour is very near. The kingdom of God is at hand. We've heard this terminology over and over and over and over again, right? We've heard it. So what are we saying? The apostles and disciples were in the garden. They were sleeping. Again, we know this was, you know, the passion, the, the, the anguish. Uh, I love the reality that Jesus kept it 100% real with the father, letting them know, listen, if, if you can pass this cup, you know, please take it away, Right. But again, paying special attention to the apostles. What do we see from this? What do we have to stay clear is, is that we have to understand the time that we're living in right now. The modern era that we're living in right now, we talk about it consistently here on the channel. We talk about it week in and week out, guys. The signs of the times is absolutely showing us how near it is to that time. And of all of people, of all people, God's people, we can absolutely not get caught sleeping because the Jesus that came back in the garden and caught the apostles sleeping is not going to be the same Jesus that cracks the sky on judgment day. So we want to make sure we understand the difference between the two Jesuses. That Jesus that was in the garden is not the one that's coming down this time to lay down his life. If anything, we already know what he's doing. He's coming to put down, not to lay down, to put down. So again, this is why we don't want to sound redundant. But again, guys, we realize that this is why uh, Bishop was opening with the phrases of don't get caught up in these little petty little war losses, these little petty little battles, because the true 
true, 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 true war that's being fought here. It was already won. We already know that when Jesus went to the cross, the battle was done. It was won. Okay. But what we're trying to say is that don't get caught sleeping. The system that we call, uh, uh, we'll call them fellowships. You can call them organizations. You can call them whatever you want. But the reality is that, no, we're not here to teach the fire and brimstone. This is not what this is about because we don't want to be so ineffective and frozen in fear that we're not effective for ministry. But what we are going to say is do not for one simple day underestimate that that sky can crack at any time. Why do we know this? Because Jesus made it clear. No man knows the day nor the hour when the son of man, that is only for God and God alone. So no matter how we want to slice the dice it, we of all people should be absolutely prepared and absolutely ready uh, for when that day comes. Um, Brother Rick, you can finish up uh, 44 through 50. I'm sorry, I should have stopped you earlier, but uh, read 44 through 50. You know? And while he said, rise, let us be going, behold, he is at hand that doeth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with came with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he had that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail master and kissed him and jesus said unto him friend wherefore art thou come then came they and laid hands on jesus and took him amen amen you could stop right there um you know i want to i i'll let uh bishop you can go ahead i don't know who, brother michael which one had your hand up first you can go ahead and i will come back and touch on this go ahead brother love this this uh chapter it's two things you see about Jesus' character. We said this in one of these uh, chapters we was doing. Uh, he never got out of character. He stayed consistent. I've been praying lately, asking God to help me stay consistent. You know, not to be one way when somebody, you know, uh, does something wrong to me or when, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm going through an unwanted or unwarranted situation and I react a certain way or when things are good, then I'm in a great mood and I act a certain way. I want one way. I want to be, I want my character to be consistent, right? But I love about Jesus, he always stayed in his godly character. He knew Jesus, Judas, Judas was coming to betray him and he kissed him. How many people, if we know they coming to, you know, turn us in, or, you know, or betray us, we kiss them. First thing we're going to say, you know, you know, you, you, you know, you sold me out, man. How could you do this to me? You know, you traitor. We're going we gonna to yell it at the top of our lungs, you know, and we won't let them kiss us or hug us or none of that. We're going to expose it immediately with Jesus. You know, he kissed him and he called him friend. You know, even though, you know, Jesus knew Judas betrayed him, he still called him friend. That blew me up, you know, because his heart was consistent for the way he loved Judas. It was still consistent there. You know, we sway. We treat people how they treat us. Technically, we, 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 we give people what the hand called for, like we say in the hood. But Jesus didn't do this with Judas, and that always blew me up about his character. You know, the type of man he was and how he dealt with situations. It always puts me to shame. That's all I want to say. Yeah, I, 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 I think that um, fathers what um Cal said was powerful about um Price's character remaining in character and being consistent. I just like the fact that uh, the flesh is so weak, you know? Like, our flesh, we don't know our flesh. Our flesh is is utterly, utterly uh, horrible. The Bible says, when good is there, evil is also present. It mm -hmm. means our flesh, you know? And the fact that um, he said to the, you know, if spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, you know, and they fell asleep at that time, you know? Like God, his ministry now, God was coming to the climax of his, about to head to the climax of his ministry or Calvary. And he had to walk, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't have nobody along with him. He had to be there by himself. Like, like he's about to go into a place now where, you know, the disciples are going to scatter. It's technically going to be him, you know. 
him finishing out, you know, climaxing his ministry. And there's times where we're going to have to be, we have to walk alone at times in Christ Jesus. You know, we won't, we won't have people to lean on, you know, it's going to be times when I didn't have people to lean on in my life. You know, it was times I had to really, it was just me and God, you know, and um, those times brothers, we have to, we have to understand, we have to stand because there's going to be times where you have to, you know, your, 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 your people's might, might, might not be, you know, the people, your, your, your dependents and, the people you lean for for support might not be there. It's going to be you and the Lord. It's going to seem like it's just y'all two versus everybody. And with him, you, that's all you need, you know. With him, it makes the majority, you know, with Christ Jesus. So the fact that he just, you know, at this time, it kind of like Christ was going, he was being separated from his uh, disciples and going into the climax of his ministry, but technically alone, you know. And he felt alone. I know he felt alone when he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. He prayed a lot of things in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, and it's just for me as a short testimony, I had a chance to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It is a very, 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 uh, very quiet place. You know, it's not a great, it's kind of depressing feeling too. When I went there, it wasn't this a, a vibrant garden? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I just kind of was capturing how Christ felt when I went to the Garden of Gethsemane and understanding that he was going to have to finish this out alone. You know, and sometimes we're going to have to run this race, guys, without people beside us. That's all I wanted to say. Hey Amen. I'm sorry, guys. I did lose, uh, lose power for momentarily. But, uh, yeah, a powerful point. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, I can't, uh, you know, I can't say enough and stress enough how important it is to understand, you know, what was really going on uh, in the garden, what was really going on in the minds of Jesus Christ. Again, we talked about and we stress to how powerful the uh, humanity uh, reality was, right? The humanity reality. Um, not only that, we talked about, you know, what was going on in the minds of, of the, these apostles, the, you know, the, the thought and the process that this was truly the end, you know, they had been riding with this man for years and they watched and they witnessed miracle after miracle after miracle, the joy uh, in the eyes of the people who had been uh, uh, delivered and healed and, and all these things. And then to know that the time was coming where this would no longer be the case. And I think um, that reality check, you know, we talk about that again, you know, what went on in the garden and how they were just, you know, who knows, you know, this, we talk about them sleeping while Jesus was in agony and prayer. But again, you know, knowing what they knew about him being the Messiah, you know, yeah, maybe they were like, yeah, we can relax. We can, we can sleep. We can rest assured. We got Jesus on our side. So a lot of things were being shaken up uh, as we speak. And the reality of it is, is that, um, you know, this is something else. But I did want to pay special attention to the question, man, in verse 50. You know, uh, friend, you know, friend, you know, knowing that Judas was doing what he was doing. I thought it was so powerful how he said, friend, where are you coming from? You know, in other words, like, I know what you're getting ready to do, you know, but I still love you. You know what I mean? I still love you. And Jesus loves us past, even when we feel like absolute failures, right? And it's something like Bishop was opening with when he was saying that no matter what's going on with us, we have to keep fighting because the thing is, we know that God loves us, you know, even no matter how bad we feel in that moment, uh, that failure that we feel in our moment, we can't let it get the best of us. Uh, and I think that's something that I thought was very, very powerful. How Jesus still, still to the end called Judas uh, his friend, right? So um, Mike said something about the Garden of Eden and the Garden uh, at Gethsemane, but let's look at some of the, uh, the, 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 the key things we want to take away with that when we talk about that. Eden being a place of uh, absolute perfection, you know, every tree in the garden we all know was good to eat. Obviously, we're supposed to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the abundance of the Garden of Eden, everything there being in perfection. Uh, we know that in Eden, again, Adam... Uh, you know, uh, his decision absolutely was to save his life, save his neck per se, uh, and, 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 and hide and dodge and duck. And, and in that act that he did, he brought in sin and suffering into the world. Uh, another thing we noticed that uh, Adam introduced mankind to the wrong way of communication 
uh, with the Holy God. In other words, when Adam was going through, when Adam was was in his struggle, unlike what you saw uh, in the garden he was, of Gethsemane, he wasn't trying to talk and engage with God and share what was on his heart, you know, and, and talk to God like, like we should know how we should talk to God. He did the exact opposite. He, he clammed up. He didn't say anything. Remember, God had to ask Adam, Adam, where, man, where art thou? Where you at? Right? He did the exact opposite. Right? And then ultimately, the decision that was made in the Garden of Eden, we all know what it did. It absolutely led to the separation of man from God. So what takes place in the Gethsemane is a little bit different contrast, right? In Gethsemane, it wasn't all abundance of trees. Like Brother Mike said, it's kind of gloomy, right? You got the, the olive trees, you know, and uh, not even a rich, vibrant, but nevertheless, uh, we know what took place in there. Um, and the agony of Jesus is very synonymous with what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. However, in Gethsemane, Jesus' decision, very, very different on the very opposite side of the spectrum of what uh, Adam did, he absolutely chose to lay down his life, right? Not to put uh, toxins and bring poison into the world, but to cleanse the world of pain and suffering, right? So Jesus' decision not to protect his neck, even though in some of the prayers he did ask if God could take the cup from him. But again, what are we saying here? We're saying that Jesus showed us how to communicate and keep it 100 with a God who loves us and creates us in all circumstances, right? Um, God is with us in all circumstances. I like something that Brother Prince shared years ago when he used to wander the streets when uh, he didn't have a place to live. And he said when he would be on the streets, he would have his his cans and his plastic bag wrapped up, right? And ready to buck, buck, right? Somebody on top of the head if they walked up to him. But he said wherever he went, if he was in a subway station homeless, if he was in a store, he said wherever he was, he knew that God was with him every step of the way, right? And when you have that kind of intimacy and communication with God, when things are good, bad, and ugly, you don't ever have to worry about the deception that Adam was operating under in the Garden of Eden, right? Keeping it 100, Jesus showed us. He told God to confess to God, hey, I don't want to do this. I'll do it because you want me to do it, but I don't really want to do this, right? And that is the kind of relationship that our God is looking for. God, I'm, I'm sick of this woman. This woman is driving me crazy. These kids, they're getting on my damn nerves. God dang it, I'm going to kill them, you know? Whatever it is, right? Keep it real with God, confess with God, talk to God. You know, he's there for us. We learned that what Jesus did. And of course, in closing, the decision that was made in the Garden of Gethsemane did the opposite of the decision that was made in the Garden of Eden. It absolutely brought us to the place of salvation, redemption for all of humanity. So I just wanted to kind of bring that full circle, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, one illustrious, beautiful, glorious, but her horrific events done there. Another garden, gloomy, doomy, and not so attractive, but the most outstanding and glorified events in human history that took place in Gethsemane. Um, yeah, floor's open. Bishop, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was powerful, brother. Never heard it put that way, doctor. Good doctor. That was profound. Um, one thing I want, before we close, I want to say something about Peter again. Even though Peter um, denied them, Mark says, you know, Peter, they said the book of Mark is technically Peter's account. So there's more intricate detail, a little bit in, in Mark's account, where the Bible says that Peter denied him, right? Uh, uh, cursing. When you hear cursing, he wasn't speaking profanity. He was invoking curses on himself, saying, if I know him, may I be damned to hell. If I know, like he really threw himself under the bus. Mm. Right? And they said when he after he said all this, he just looked at Christ and went away bitterly, like so discouraged, like we spoke about. The loss that he he experienced was incurable apart from the Holy Spirit. But he says something uh, uh powerful I love about God. Even though Peter said, Lord, I would die for you. It wasn't that he wouldn't. 
Peter wasn't ready yet. He had to be prepared to take that type of stand for Christ in his walk, his preparation, even though in his heart he thought he was ready. Now, like a lot of us, when I first got saved, I was ready. I'm like, Lord, send me. I will go. You know, I will do it. I will do it. And then when I went through so much and, you know, so many failures and failed situations, failed relationships, not living up to all, like Brother Mike said, my own expectations, because God already knows us, you know. Uh, uh, I was so discouraged, and Peter was too. But, you know, the beautiful thing later on in his life, Peter did lay his life down. See, he meant that, but it wasn't time. A lot of us, we mean it, but Satan's job is to choke it out of us. Oh, you didn't mean that. Get you to hmm. second guess when you made promises and was sincere to God and get you to be like, see, if you did, why you did this? If you meant that, why you did this? Why you mess with her? Why you beat him up? Why you did this? Why mm. are you doing that? And he gets you to be like, well, maybe I, I didn't mean it, right? Mm. See, when Jesus um, went to Peter the second time, and I want to climax, you know, I know he's getting ready to close. And he said, he said, Peter, you love me? Peter wasn't so gun ho this time. He was humble. Mm. He didn't just jump, jump to his guns. He just said, Lord, well, you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't commit. He said, Lord, you like he said, do you love me? Like it's two words in the Greek. We don't see it again. We said one 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 uh, English word could represent maybe seven or eight Greek words. And there's two words that's being used there. We just see love in the English. One is agape unconditionally. The other one is phileo. It's like a strong like. And when Jesus was saying, Peter, do you love me? He was saying agape and Peter wouldn't commit this time. He's like, Lord, well, you know, I like you I like you a lot. <laughs> You know, you know, like when the women ask you, you love me, you be like, oh, boo, well, I really like you. I like you a whole lot. Right. And that's technically what, what Peter was saying. And that when he committed and he and he was real with Jesus, just like what, what Ron is saying about that 100 percent. And he said, Lord, well, you know, all things, you know, he said, OK, Peter, I could use you now. Go feed my sheep because he was real. All the time. He didn't underestimate the power of his weak flesh this time. He recognized that he was suspect. He could fall at any time. And when he got there, Jesus said, now I can use you, man. Mm. Now you could be my man. And Peter went on and laid his life down for the Lord. But he, he had things in him. God had to get a lot of us got a lot of stuff in us. God got to get out before we could be that man in our heart that we wanted to be, you know, that we thought we could be. It's a lot of things there. God is shifting out of us and we don't realize it, but he is. And then we could do and live up to all those promises we made in the beginning. Amen. Amen. Powerful. Powerful point. Amen, Amen. brother. Powerful Amen. Point. Accurate. Powerful. Amen. Um, brother Mike, what you got? Amen. Man? I mean, that was, I mean, I, I can't come behind that because that was powerful the way uh, the, the bishop climaxed that. Um, but I would say is that, you know. He, he, when he's when they see Christ resurrected and they realize death had no power, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was also a part of the timing, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a time in our life when men realize that this life that death don't, don't death don't have no power, you know. For a long time, even when I was saved, I still felt like death had power, you know. It's not until you get to that full understanding that death has no power over you, you know, that you can walk, you know, freely, you know. Because we're still slaves to our lives in a lot of ways. We want we want stuff in our life, the American dream. There's just things in this life that make us kind of like not really go full flesh with our hearts for Christ Jesus. Because we still kind of caught up in this life, you know. But when they see Christ resurrected, they realize, man, death has no power, you know. Like this life is not everything. When they really, really, really got that, you know, in their hearts, seared in their minds, you know, they was ready. They was really ready, you know. And it's hard for us to really get, you know, fulfill our ministries when we wrapped up in this life. I know for a long time I've wrapped up in my life, you know, for a long time. And still at times I still do get wrapped up in this life. And I have to like, well, well catch myself like, well, what am I doing? Well, the Holy Spirit will come talk to you like, Mike, what you think about down there? So the key thing I just want to come behind the bishop by saying, don't get caught up in this life so much. You know, guys, the Bible says that we're going to have a new body and we shall live with him forever, you know, and be together forever. And that reality has to be a reality for us. We have to live like that's real. We have to walk in our lives and walk every day, our day to days, like that's going to happen. And as long as we don't really believe that's going to happen, you know, we're going to kind of still get caught up a little bit. But at that time, the disciples, when they came back, they understood very clearly that 
you know, it's, there's a new life and a new body and that this is not everything, you know. And when they had that reality, 100% in their minds and hearts, they, you know, they was ready to go. And I just want to encourage us all to let y'all know that this life is not everything, you know. You know, the eschatological hope, you know, in Christ Jesus that we have and that we will be with him forever, guys, with new bodies, those who are saved and born again. And we have that reality and we, and we live like that's real and act like that's real and deliver our day to days like that's real. It'll change our attitudes a lot. That's all I wanted to say, brother. Amen. Uh, on that note, I, I think we can close there for the week. Um, and, and again, just, just, just the words of encouragement. Uh, love how we put it together. And um, um, guys, you, you know, as we said, the battle's not over. As long as God has given us the opportunity to wake up uh, like he did this morning, then we know that there's still a lot of unfinished business. And like the good minister put it, uh, when we're focused on what the mission is at hand, we always understand God will always take care of our fundamental needs organically by just following through with the things that he wants us to do for him. So on that note, uh, that's all I can You think your life is like a song, do, 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 do. but you know you living wrong. Do, 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 do. You think your life is like a song. Do, 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 Question. Ask yourself what you're doing or who you're pursuing Is it gratifying you spiritually or physically? Temporarily, temple things feel good Until you stand before the Lord like what's good But you don't hear me You need Jesus more than your breath but you don't feel me I know you think you're hard cause you're not serving Christ Heading for hellfire, now that ain't life I know in the hood you see mad phony cats But thank God Jesus Christ never turned his back He said on the cross it's finished, that's enough I'm tired of all this false religion, man, y'all ain't tough What you doing?